In this video, we'll perform another component space analysis of rotations in the plane, except this time we'll do it with respect to a basis that's not Cartesian. And this is actually one of my favorite kinds of calculations to do. The kind of calculation where you know that everything will work out in the end, you know that all of the key relationships like this one will continue to hold, the only things that are left to find out is the details, exactly how everything will work out. And because the basis has changed, we know that many of the entries in the matrices will change, maybe change completely. Yet all of the key relationships will continue to hold. So that's what makes this calculation so intriguing. It's like watching a well-written show on TV, except this show was written by a higher authority. So let's get to the task at hand. We're once again dealing with rotations in the plane by the angle alpha and our task is once again to derive the matrix that represents this transformation with respect to this basis. But this basis is not Cartesian. It's still orthogonal, and one of the vectors is length 1, but the other one is length 2. Okay, the procedure for constructing the matrix is the same as always. We will apply the transformation to each of the uh, basis vectors and represent the images with respect to the basis itself. So let's go ahead and do it. We know exactly how to do it. Use orange chalk. We'll first apply the rotation to E1. And the result is, will be right here. Let's assume this is angle alpha. So E1 becomes this vector right here. This is R sub alpha of E1. Okay, it's still length 2. So now we have to decompose it with respect to this basis. Familiar procedure. Okay, and we have to realize that its component with respect to E1 is still cosine alpha, but its component with respect to E2 is no longer sine alpha. It was sine alpha when this vector was half the length and we ended up right here. Okay, so when this was 1, this segment right here was sine alpha. Now it's 2 sine alpha, so we need 2 of E2. So the first column is cosine alpha, as you can see from this triangle, and 2 sine alpha. So let's put it in. Cosine alpha and 2 sine alpha. So similar to the matrix that we obtained in the Cartesian case, but there is now this 2. Okay, so different. Okay, now let's perform the same thing for E2. We now need to rotate E2 by the same angle alpha. All right, and let's try to figure out its component. So it's R sub 2, excuse me, R sub alpha of E2. Okay, its length is 1. So its components are minus half cosine alpha. Right? That's because it's the same type, the same segment as in the case of a Cartesian basis, except now we have to decompose this vector right here with respect to a vector that's twice as long. Or in other words, compare the length of this vector to a vector that's twice as long as it was before. So before it was minus sine alpha, so it's now minus half sine alpha, minus one half minus one-half sine alpha and this as before is cosine alpha. Let me put in this detail just for completeness sake. So cosine alpha. Okay, so that task is finished. We have a matrix that's very similar to the matrix we had before except now we have a two here and a negative one-half here. So I think the property that we would doubt the most is that this continues to work out because there are just too many twos and one halves mixed in. It would be interesting to see exactly how this property works out. So let's start with that. Let's copy R sub alpha here and I'll put R sub beta here. So here we have cosine alpha minus one half sine alpha, two sine alpha, and cosine alpha. And here same thing with beta plugged in in place of alpha. Cosine beta 
minus one half sine theta, two sine beta, and cosine beta. So let's think for a moment what we expect here. What we expect here is not the matrix that we had here in the previous video where we were working with a Cartesian basis, cosine sine minus sine cosine. No, the matrix that we expect is this matrix with alpha plus beta plugged in for alpha. So that's what's so interesting to find out, how all of these one-halves and twos will work out just right. So let's see how that happens. Let's start with this entry, which should end up being cosine of alpha plus beta. And remember the trig identities that I no longer have on the board. So we have cosine alpha cosine beta minus, excuse me, jump down here, cosine alpha cosine beta minus and do you see how the two cancels the one half? Minus sine alpha, sine beta. So the one half and two interact perfectly just to give us the right term that goes here. Cosine of alpha plus beta. Now let's see what happens down here. We have, so it's these two, two cosine alpha sine beta plus two cosine beta sine alpha or in alphabetical order, two cosine alpha sine beta plus two sine alpha cosine beta. Perfectly two times sine of alpha plus beta. All right, let's work out this one. We have minus one half sine alpha cosine beta, minus one half cosine alpha sine beta. So exactly minus one half, each term had minus one half. So we have minus one half sine of alpha plus beta perfectly. And just for our edification, let's see what goes over here. We have what two cancels minus one half, so we have minus sine alpha sine beta plus cosine alpha cosine beta. Exactly cosine, I'm abbreviating it, of alpha plus beta. So even though the matrix was much more complicated and there were really strange coefficients here and there, everything worked out perfectly. And this, of course, would continue to hold no matter what basis you chose. Even if you chose a non-orthogonal, completely general affine basis, these matrices would begin to look very weird. But this relationship will continue to hold. Why? Because this relationship is not the property of the matrices, it's the property of the linear transformation itself. So that's why this relationship will of course continue to hold. And this once again tells us that these matrices commute. The argument is the same. If we were to multiply them in the opposite order, we would get R of beta plus alpha, which of course is the same as R sub alpha plus beta. They commute. And once again, to get the inverse of this matrix, we just have to plug in minus alpha for alpha, which will make the minus sign jump from here to here. Once again, uh, this matrix will have no eigenvalues by the same argument as we used before. Let's calculate its trace and its determinant. So we'll start with the determinant, which of course, as we discussed towards the end of that video, is the property of the, of the linear transformation and not the matrix itself. So we're expecting once again that the determinant is one, which would be the case always, once again, regardless of the choice of the basis. So we have cosine squared alpha, the minuses cancel, minus minus, so cosine squared alpha plus two cancels one half plus sine squared alpha, once again one. And the trace is once again two cosine alpha as before, so the trace is unchanged, the determinant is unchanged, and therefore the eigenvalue characteristics is unchanged. We could repeat the same argument to confirm that this matrix doesn't have any real eigenvalues unless alpha is a multiple of pi. Okay. Finally, the property that has to do with length, pres with, the, with length preservation under rotations in the plane. Of course, lengths are preserved, and if we recall, matrices that represent transformations that preserve lengths with respect to Cartesian bases have this property. This is, these matrices are called orthogonal. 
Would this continue to hold? And very importantly, this relationship hinged on the Cartesian property of the basis. Because the way we derived this relationship was by using the fact that this expression represents the length of the vector alpha in R2 or R3 or Rn. And this, of course, is only true when the basis is Cartesian. It would not be true with respect to this basis. So our derivation of this identity would no longer be valid. So we no longer expect this identity to be true. This identity is very much a Cartesian type identity. So let's see if it actually holds. We don't expect it to hold. So let's see. R inverse, where can I write it? Let me erase this part, creating a bit of a mess, but that's okay. So R inverse is obtained by plugging in the minus, minus alpha in place of alpha. So the net result will be that this minus will jump from here to here because the cosine function doesn't care and the sine function flips its sign. So we'll have a minus sign here. And is, so this is R of minus alpha. And the question is, is this matrix the transpose of this one? And of course it's not. For it to be a transpose of this one, the one half would have to be here and two would have to be here. So this is no longer the transpose, which is not surprising at all because that property hinged on the basis, let me finish that, no longer the transpose of the original matrix because that property hinged on the Cartesian property of the basis. So there we go. We have repeated our component space analysis of rotations in the plane. We discovered the matrix that represents rotations in the plane with respect to this non-Cartesian basis and confirmed that it satisfies the properties we expect it to satisfy and that it doesn't satisfy the properties we expect it not to satisfy. So it was a complete success and unfolded like a TV show.